yesterday uh, to remind those of you who were, who were here and to inform those of you who couldn't be, uh, I focused on some of the uh, developments affecting liberal democracy here in the United States. What I want to do in today's lecture is to pull the camera back and place what's happening in the United States in a broader context of what's happening throughout the democratic West. Uh, after I do that in broad brush strokes, I'll focus on a couple of European case studies, namely Hungary and Poland, and then I'll end with some concluding reflections on where things stand. For those of you who are interested in attending the third lecture, uh, I will drop my empirical researcher amateur act and actually focus on what I was trained to do, namely a little bit of political theory. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of my remarks and in the interests of brevity read some others. Uh, and let, let me begin with the frame for the first part of this presentation, which is that although American exceptionalism is a sturdy trope of, you know, of commentary and scholarly discourse, when it comes to politics since the Second World War, the United States has been anything but exceptional. As I tell the story, politics in the United States has moved along with the major currents of post-World War II history. Uh, and I divide this story in, into four periods. Uh, the first, is, the first is the roughly three decades after World War I, when in one way or another, uh, the nations that had to rebuild uh, after World War I, some from close to scratch, and the nations that had managed to get through it relatively unscathed were both engaged in the same project, which was the creation of social democratic welfare states. Uh, the United States, of course, started in a different place institutionally and culturally from Western Europe, but there was a remarkable consensus across party lines for three decades. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, you know, with his espousal of modern republicanism, in effect, by design, very explicitly, uh, led his party, the Republican Party, to make peace with the New Deal after 20 years of warfare against it. And not only that, to extend the New Deal, particularly in Hamiltonian directions, it, I think, uh, suffices to mention the interstate highway system, his major domestic accomplishment, which we're dining off uh, to this day, and extending all the way through the presidency of Richard Nixon, who on domestic policy was probably the most liberal president, president we have ever had. Uh, after those three decades throughout the West, uh, there, was, there was a period of, of economic turmoil and of reconsideration that led to phase two, uh, a phase of conservative both retrenchment and construction. Uh, Ronald Reagan in the United States, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, uh, Helmut Kohl in Germany, and improbably Francois Mitterrand in France, who came into office pledged to extend socialism, but was forced after about 18 months to make his famous U-turn and in effect uh, open, open France towards more free market institutions. And this phase was succeeded by phase three, what I'll call the third way phase of post-World War II history. Uh, the key figures here were uh, Bill Clinton, of course, but also Tony Blair in the UK and Gerhard Schroeder uh, in Germany. And 
all, all of them, uh, on the one hand, rejected the, the practice and the principles of conservatism, but on the other hand, tried to find an alternative to the post-World War II model of social democratic construction. And this, this, involved, in, this involved in many ways uh, an opening up of the center left to various principles and themes from outside what had been the center left tradition. And it was, it was a synthesis that served reasonably well. Then came the Great Recession and a period of a period of political turmoil that has led to where we are now, the fourth phase of post-World War II uh, Western history, uh, a populist surge. And without defining populism very precisely right now, I'd like to describe this surge in broad outlines. It is the fourth great convergence of post-World War II democratic politics from the heartland of Europe to the Midlands of the United Kingdom uh, to America's Midwest. A revolt has gathered strength against the arrangements that have shaped the democratic West since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, this surge threatens the assumption and, assumptions and achievements of politicians and policymakers from mainstream parties, center left and center right. Economic policies based on free trade and flexible labor markets are under attack. Cultural norms celebrating diversity and promoting immigration are losing traction. International agreements and institutions are surrendering ground to nationalist forces. Uh, the Great Recession, of course, set the stage for these discontents, but other developments, specifically the surges of migration across Europe in response to civil war in, in Syria and drought in Africa, exacerbated them. The failure of past reforms to stem the tide of illegal immigration had similar consequences in the United States. But, and this is a familiar story, so I will be brief, larger forces are at work. Technological change has triggered new modes of production and a shift towards more knowledge-intensive economies, weakening industrial-era mass manufacturing throughout the West. These forces have also catalyzed the rise of an education-based meritocracy that dominates government, the bureaucracy, the media, and major metropolitan areas. The emergence of this new elite has left less educated citizens in outlying towns and rural areas feeling denigrated, devalued, and ignored, sowing the seeds of resentment. These trends that I've just listed are deepening divisions between more and less educated citizens, between those who benefit from technological change and those who feel threatened by it, between the cities and the countryside, between long established groups and newer entrants into the civic community, between those who celebrate dynamism and diversity and those who prize stability and homogeneity. Elite preference for open societies is running up against strengthening public demands for new forms of economic, cultural, and political closure. But the challenge goes even deeper in my estimation. Some parties on the left and right are calling into question the norms and institutions of liberal democracy itself, especially freedom of the press, the rule of law, and the rights of minorities. Throughout the West, there's rising impatience with governments that seem incapable of acting forcefully in the face of mounting problems. Rising insecurity has triggered a demand for strong leaders, risking a return to forms of authoritarianism that many believe had been left behind for good a quarter of a century ago. Now, 
let me place these developments in the context of the trajectory of democracy since the end of the Second, the Second World War. Uh, between 1974 and 2006, you'll see why I mentioned 2006 in just a minute, electoral democracies rose from 29 to 61% of governments around the world. And liberal democracies rose from 21% to 41%. This was a global democratic surge without precedent, I believe, in human history. And 2006 was, by uh, coincidence, the year that I joined the board of the National Endowment for Democracy, on which I served for nine years. And I came to quarterly meetings faithfully for those nine years, and I kept on asking myself, why am I hearing so much bad news? Where's the progress? Right? Everybody was saying democratic surge. What I didn't know, didn't appreciate, the owl of Minerva flapping its wings at its accustomed time, what I didn't appreciate was uh, that 2006 represented precisely the end of this great democratic surge. And according to the best global indicators, there has been a democratic recession, a receding at the, at the very least, every year since then. Uh, as a matter of fact, 2016, according to Freedom House, was the 11th consecutive years, year in which countries around the world suffered net declines in political and civil liberties, outnumbered the gainers. In nearly all of these years, the gap between losses and gains was substantial. Uh, and along with the, this quantitative erosion was a qualitative erosion, a decline in the quality of democracy as measured by political rights, civil liberties, transparency, and the rule of law. You know, as the authoritative annual report, Freedom in the World 2017 put it, while in past years the declines in freedom were generally concentrated among autocracies and dictators, it simply went from bad to worse. In 2016, it was established democracies that dominated the list of countries suffering setbacks. And that brings me back to my topic for this evening, because there are signs of decline in Hungary and Poland and even to some extent France. Uh, and I want to talk about Hungary and Poland as important case studies in just, just a few minutes. Uh, and uh, there's broad agreement, it seems to me, that compared to the three decades of democratic advances from the mid-1970s to 2006, the past decade has witnessed a, you know, a sapping, uh, a waning of the energy, efficacy, and self-confidence of Western democracies. Now, the challenge, it seems to me, takes two forms. Uh, there's an external challenge, uh, the authoritarian surge, uh, which began as a defensive re response to the wave of color revolutions that began in Georgia, spread to UK, Ukraine, Belarus, and several other countries before reaching Iran in the Green Revolution of 2009. And it wasn't long before global autocracies went on the offensive uh, and began to make common cause in specific policy arenas and more broadly. Uh, and I could go on for quite some, tea, it's quite some time about the authorian turn, uh, which has been developing with countries such as Russia, China, and, and Iran, and some of the Gulf states as the principal players. But what I really want to focus on is not the external challenge, but rather the internal challenge to liberal democracy, which is likely to prove more consequential for democratic governance. Uh, these challenges began as opposition to policies that liberal democracies had pursued for decades, such as free trade, international institution building, and relatively open immigration and refugee policies. Uh, but 
it went beyond that in countries where christianity and traditional values remain strong segments of the population oppose liberal social policies as well as official movement towards what these groups regard as secularism often this opposition takes the form of antipathy to political economic and cultural elites now let me underscore uh, this was a point that came up in the Q&A yesterday. None of what I've said so far necessarily poses a threat to liberal democracy. For example, strong leaders such as Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, Charles de Gaulle, have been compatible with representative institutions and respect for individual rights. Indeed, such strong leaders have been essential for the preservation of liberal democracy in dark times. Problems arise from when the yearning for strong leadership gives rise to anti-democratic sentiments. Uh, a leading scholar uh, of French politics, uh, Patrick uh, Chamorel, has observed that the Front National in France has expressed admiration for not only Vladimir Putin's nationalist and traditionalist values, but also for his cult of order and for his authoritarian leadership. Now, why these problems? Why now? Uh, let me try to frame it. These developments are taking place against the backdrop of mounting threats to the liberal democratic order, the United States took the lead in creating after the end of World War II. Throughout this period, a bargain between political leaders and citizens has defined the perimeter of this order. Working through bureaucracies, popularly elected governments would deliver economic growth, rising living standards, social protections for health, employment, and retirement, domestic tranquility, and the abatement of international threats. In return, the public would defer to political and policy elites. Now, for an extended period after World War II, this bargain held, and public support for their leaders and for liberal democracy more generally remained high. More recently, however, governments have failed to deliver on their end of the bargain, and public confidence has waned. While for some, liberal democracy may be an intrinsic good, an end in itself, I won't bow to Kant in this lecture, Bill. For most, it is a means to prosperous, peaceful, and secure lives. It is, in short, a tree known by its fruit. And if it ceases to produce the expected crop, all bets are off. And I could go through a number of different areas of democratic performance uh, you know, in the economic sphere, in the political sphere, in the governance sphere, and show case after case after case where the ability of, demo of liberal democratic governments to measure up to public expectations uh, had l has led to a decline in public confidence in those institutions and their leaders. Uh, I mentioned before the gap, the growing gap between cities and the countryside. Uh, and I want to say a little bit more about that because this, this distinction between urban areas and peripheries, I think, is one of the central features uh, of our current times. Uh, this cleavage between citizens, cities and the countryside is as old as human history. You know, read Aristophanes to see comic representations of it. Uh, but recent events have exacerbated it. Urban dwellers tend to, provide, tend to prize heterogene heterogeneity and dynamism. Denizens of small towns and rural areas prefer homogeneity and stability. Cities lean, lean towards social liberalism. Non-urban areas towards social traditionalism. Religion, often of the conservative variety, tends to be stronger in the countryside. City folk often regard the residents of rural areas 
and small towns as, quote, country bumpkins without high levels of education and cultural sophistication, generating the inevitable backlash against urban elites who are seen as lacking respect for their fellow citizens. This brings me to the, the two European case studies on which I'd like to focus, namely Hungary and Poland. And I'd like to go through these case studies in some detail because I think they're illustrative of the ways in which uh, reservations about the performance of liberal democratic governance, governments and leaders can move step by step towards uh, you know, the partial rejection of liberal democracy as a regime form. Uh, this is, uh, these two countries, I believe, illustrate the ways in which there can be a transition step by step to forms of government that are liberal democratic, to forms of government that, that it's, it's hard to regard in that light. And this is a sad story with a happy beginning. Uh, and I say that because after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, uh, Hungary and Poland underwent remarkably successful and rapid transitions to democratic governance and market liberalization. Fears, and they were widespread at the time, that these post-communist states would be gripped by authoritarianism, nationalism, and xenophobia were allayed by support for liberal norms and consistent moves towards alignment with the West. Today, however, these two countries are experiencing a powerful emergence of populist and illiberal political forces that, thresh, that threaten to usher in a new era of democratic backsliding. Hungary's Fidesz and Poland's Law and Justice, the two principal political parties in those respective countries, all openly embrace authoritarian actions, delegitimize political opposition, uh, call for extreme majoritarianism, and express skepticism about or outright hostility to the rights of powerless minorities. For many proponents of liberal democracy, the post-communist transition signaled that the West had decisively won the ideological battles of the 20th century. It was common wisdom that once democracy in a particular country has been consolidated, the political system was safe and democracy was here to stay. This is, de this is democratization, the Roach Motel theory of democratization. You can, you can enter a democracy, but you can't, democratic state, but you can't leave it. Uh, and Hungary and Poland, held their first free parliamentary elections in 1990 and 1991, respectively. They both joined NATO in 1999. 2004, they both became members of the EU, along with six other Central and, Europe and Eastern European countries. Throughout the 1990s, Hungary benefited from an influx of foreign investment, while Poland was heralded as the poster child for liberal reform. By 2014, the Polish economy had grown more than 4% a year uh, in the previous two decades, making it the sixth largest economy in the European Union and the continent's fastest growing. Between 1989 and 2012, living standards in Poland more than doubled. Against this backdrop, the emergence of populist movements in these countries and the, the electoral success they've enjoyed has sent shockwaves across Europe. I was one of the people who genuinely believed that Poland and Hungary were unalloyed success stories. I should have looked more carefully, uh, and now is an occasion for me to rectify my, my mistake, albeit belatedly. Uh, if you, if you probed the economic successes and social developments of this happy period after the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall, 
and the collapse of the Soviet Union, another side of the story emerges. In both countries, Poland and Hungary, many groups felt excluded from the economic growth that accompanied market liberalization. In Hungary, the 1990s and early 2000s showed a widening gap between the winners and losers of regime change, between the living standards of the capital city Budapest and the rest of the country. During its post-communist transition, Hungary experienced rising inflation and some experienced a decline in real wages. Similarly, while Poland's overall economy improved significantly in the post-communist era, rural Poland stagnated. And in the face of large-scale structural unemployment, many Poles left the country to seek work, seek work elsewhere, generating the phenomenon of the Polish plumber that became a major point of debate uh, not long thereafter in the UK, in France, and elsewhere. In, in some areas of, of Poland's rural east, where law and justice enjoys significant support, unemployment is double the national average. As one trade union activist from Eastern Poland remarked, quote, this is the backwater of Europe. If it could, Warsaw would fill it with a forest. In both Hungary and Poland, populist parties have capitalized on these widespread economic disparities. Uh, originally founded as a student movement in 1988, Hungary's Fidesz party has undergone several changes, including flirtations with libertarianism and conservatism. Since 2010, when it won a supermajority in the Hungarian parliamentary elections, the party has settled on a firmly nationalist stance. Uh, this electoral success followed revelations that Hungary's socialist prime minister had lied about the country's collapsing budget to secure his reelection, a scandal many connect with Hungary's 2008 international bailout and the ensuing austerity measures. It's no surprise then that Fidesz's anti-bank rhetoric, staunch opposition to foreign investors, and derision of multinational financial institutions resonated with voters in the 2010 election. But Fidesz does not merely propose an alternative to the EU's globalist outlook. The party combines economic success, family values, and religious devotion in a broad platform reflecting Hungarian leader Viktor Orban's vision of what he calls a Christian national culture. Similarly, the Populist Law and Justice Party in Poland promotes economic populism and calls for a, quote, Christian democracy. Campaigning on a traditionalist critique of post-Soviet Poland as corrupt and as in need of moral and political renewal, the party calls for regulation and intervention in the market to lift up Polish citizens. These demands include an increase in the minimum wage, improved family benefits, taxation of foreign banks' assets, job creation, and limits on central bank independence. So far, so good. All of that is firm, all of those policy shifts are firmly within the perimeter of social democratic norms. It's in further steps that problems arise uh, because both of these leading political parties in Poland and Hungary have been characterized by intense antipathy to immigrants and refugees. Both parties believe that the refugee crisis poses one of the greatest threats to Europe, and the two actually join forces in a lawsuit against the EU's refugee quota system. In response to the refugee crisis, uh, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, the co-founder of Law and Justice in Poland, warned that, rep that refugees were, quote, bringing in all kinds of parasites and claimed that Muslim migrants posed a threat to Polish values. Similarly, Victor's, Hungary's Victor, uh, Victor Orban declared, migration is not a solution but a problem, not a medicine but a poison, 
We don't need it and won't swallow it. Since coming to power, both, party have, both parties have restricted the independence of the courts, forced the media not to report in ways that the regime, the government requires, uh, judges would violate the interests of the nation, and has sought to discredit non-governmental organizations as, quote, foreign agents. In Hungary, this wide array of measures includes the criminalization of homelessness, media regulations that permit the government to fine outlets for unbalanced or insulting coverage, the introduction of measures that allow ethnic Hungarians living outside the country to vote in national elections, and new limits on access to public information. In Poland, law and justice brought its chief prosecutor under the Ministry of Justice, removing the position's independence, licensed the Ministry of the Treasury to impose the head of public broadcasting, and under President Andrzej Duda, the, public, the party has even challenged the right of peaceful assembly by enacting a bill that imposes stringent, and many groups believe, would say crippling requirements on efforts to plan public gatherings and marches and protests. In a famous 2014 speech, Hungary's Orban laid out his vision for his country, declaring, and I quote, the new state that we are building is an illiberal state. He and his supporters insist that this form of illiberalism is not a front for personal ambitions and is not a stalking horse for the creation of autocracy. As one scholar writes, Hungarian President Viktor Orban's espousal of illiberal democracy still offers lip service to democracy. Indeed, this is a strategy on which Orban's brand of populism depends. By embracing dem democracy, at least verbally, Orban legitimates his attack on liberal institutions and practices as antithetical to Hungarian interests. Addressing a group of party activists in 2009, Orban issued a resounding rejection of pluralist politics, and his words deserve careful attention and scrutiny, I believe. And he said in this speech, Hungarian politics over the next 15 to 20 years will not be determined by a dual power block, by which he meant two major competing political parties, which, due to constant debate regarding values, generates divisive, petty, and unnecessary social consequences. Instead, he went on, a large governing party is being formed, a central political field of force, which will be able to address national issues. And this will not be done by constant debates, but it will represent these debates in its own natural way. Orban similarly stressed the inefficiencies of multi-party politics in his refusal to participate in debates leading up to either the 2010 or 2014 elections. He said, and I quote, no policy-specific debates are needed now. The alternatives in front of us are obvious. Uh, Poland's Law and Justice Party leader, Jaroslaw Kaczynski, has also described pluralist politics as plagued with chaos and perpetual war. And the head of Law and Justice's parliamentary caucus, when asked about the need for political compromise among opposing forces, replied, well, what kind of compromise do you need? There's no need for one. Uh, in an effort to delegitimize its political opposition, Law and Justice performed an audit of its predecessor, the centrist pro-European civic platform. This process featured accusations that the party had wasted billions of government dollars, sold out Polish interests to the EU, and conspired with Russia. For populists governing in the interests of the people and establishing an illiberal state apparatus are inextricably linked because they insist counterfactually that the people form a homogeneous group with common interests whose only, dis you know, whose only dis 
whose only disputes are with elites who stand apart from the people. Although today's populace in Hungary and Poland decry the injustice of liberal institutions and practices, it was only 28 years ago that Poland set out in pursuit of liberal democracy to secure economic and political freedom. The trade union movement, Solidarity, who, whose success led to Poland's first free elections, led with the slogan, quote, there is no bread without freedom. So what underlies the rejection of liberal democracy in favor of populist democracy with authoritarian tendencies in Poland and Hungary. Uh, some argue that the unique structural and historical challenge, uh, challenges liberal democracy confronts in post-communist Europe uh, strengthen the populist backlash. In Hungary and Poland, these scholars say, the roots of democracy are shallow. Democratic institutions and practices are relatively weak and civil society remains underdeveloped. In post-communist countries, moreover, the desire to assert a strong national identity can be explained historically. As one observer notes, quote, Eastern Europeans were ruled for centuries by successive empires of Ottoman, Russian, Habsburg, fascist, and communist authoritarian regimes. A hunger for national identity and honor among the peoples of the region grew out of oppression by their rulers. Thus the, thus, the argument goes, the political climate in Hungary and Poland is particularly ripe for the nativist commitments of populist parties. But there's another way of telling the story, and here I rely on the work of a major European scholar, Ivan Kostev. He points out that liberal democracy challenges its citizens in two fundamental ways. It asks the powerful to safeguard not only their rights, but also the rights of powerless minorities. And it asks a majority to think of itself as a possible future minority, and thus to be willing to embrace constitutional provisions that limit the majoritarian concentration of power. Given the immediate historical backdrop of communist oppression, Krastev argues, a typical citizen in post-communist Europe was capable of embracing the more arduous elements of, civ of civic participation in liberal democracy. As Krastev puts it, having seen real state repression, these voters were willing to think like a minority even when in the majority. Communism's role in shaping this self-restraint of the voter was communists un communism's unintentional gift to the cause of liberal dem democratic consolidation. A very interesting thesis with a lot to it, in my opinion. Uh, while the particularities of the post-communist period account for rapid and successful consolidation of liberal democracy in Eastern Europe, Krastev continues, it also clarifies its present day populist challenges. The process of European integration pursued by post-communist states meant that major economic decisions were taken out of the electoral arena, leaving identity politics as a dominant vehicle for political appeals. This weakness in the liberal democratic transition where the politics of identity could easily be leveraged for electoral contestation proved potent when combined with the historical fear of multiculturalism in Eastern Europe. As Krastev writes, the post-communist countries know not only the advantages but also the dark sides of multiculturalism. For many of them, a return to ethnic diversity suggests a return to the troubled interwar period. This historical context, among, its, uh, among other things, clarifies the present day demographic panic in response to the refugee crisis. The wave of liberal democratic consolidation after the collapse of the Soviet Union reflected exceptional historical circumstances. If the disease was tyranny, then liberal democracy was the cure. 
But when concrete and e economic and social issues move to the fore, the capacity of liberal democratic government to address these issues becomes crucial. The comparison is no longer with the communist past, but rather with a challenging present. And many of these governments proved unequal to that challenge. Populism represents a response to the perceived inability of liberal democratic governments to meet these challenges and to do so in a genuinely inclusive manner. The groups that felt left behind by economic modernization and cultural liberalization insisted on being heard and it was the populist parties and only the populist parties that responded to these demands. Today, leaders like Kaczynski and Orban do not merely promise to enshrine an ethnocentric conception of national identity into public life and laws. They also frame their push for illiberalism as a pragmatic path towards achieving economic prosperity. In laying out his vision for what he was the first to call illiberal democracy, Orban stated, quote, we are searching for and we are doing our best to find parting ways with Western European dogmas, making ourselves independent from them, the form of organizing a community that is capable of making us competitive in the great world race. Similarly, Yaroslav Kaczynski insists, it is completely untrue that to achieve Western levels of development, we need to adopt their social and political models. That is hogwash, close quote. A leading, a leading scholar of contemporary populism, uh, Kasmuda, notes that the populist radical right doesn't attack the system in an all-out fashion like the political extremes of the early 20th century. Instead, Muller argues, the threat to, to democracy comes from within the democratic world because the political actors posing the danger speak the language of democratic values. From this standpoint, populism represents a kind of corrective, albeit misguided, to an elite-driven project that proceeded all too often over the heads of too many citizens. Still, populist rejection of pluralist politics presents a danger to the liberal democratic order which stands or falls with the recognition of individual rights, social pluralism, and the need for reasonable compromise among diverse and competing interests. As we've seen, broader trends have contributed to democratic erosions. After the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the range of political debate in the West narrowed. As economic globalization and international institutions became the lingua franca of political discourse, center-right and center-left parties converged. And in several countries, they actually came together in grand coalitions. This consensus, some would call it a duopoly, proved workable as long as favorable economic and security conditions prevailed. But when the tide started turning after 2007, established parties and institutions found it difficult to respond to rising public discontent. Gridlock, whether in the United States or in the European Union, preserved the status quo, which increasing numbers of citizens found unacceptable. Citizens became impatient with political arrangements that seemed incapable of responding with the kind of bold action that circumstances required. Frustrated groups found outlets in new, often marginal, political parties, but also through leaders who promised more effective institutional arrangements, even at some cost to liberal democracy. In a related development, the unpopular, the unpopular ineffective response of international institutions to both economic and refugee crises contributed to a resurgence of nationalism in many parts of the West. The UK's stunning decision to leave the European Union was a sign of this trend, as was Donald Trump's America First foreign policy. In Central and Eastern Europe, long-muted nationalist sentiments have surged. 
Although nationalism has often led to anti-democratic changes, these recent developments do not necessarily represent an erosion of democracy. The vote for Brexit, for example, was a peaceful exercise of democratic decision making. Many British citizens said that they voted to leave the EU in order to regain the capacity for democratic self-government, which in their view had been surrendered to unelected bureaucrats in Brussels. On the other hand, the rising nationalist tide in Poland in Hungary does, in my judgment, pose a frontal threat to liberal democracy. And the question before us now is whether it will, be, whether it will spread or rather be contained. Some people have taken comfort, for, for example, from the results of the election in the Netherlands, where uh, where the um, uh, where the sort of the, the nationalist uh, nationalist populist party failed to make the expected the, the gains that were expected. What this overlooks is that the person who won the election, the sitting prime minister, did so only by co-opting the policy space that the populist party had demarcated. He won not by opposing the populist party, but by imitating it. Uh, some people ha are also taking comfort from the fact uh, that Marine Le Pen and the National Front in France appear likely to lose the forthcoming second round of the French presidential election. Overlooked in that, is that the National Front is likely to get at least twice as many votes as it ever has before in a presidential election, twice as large a share of the popular vote as it ever has before. And if a, if, if a political novice without a political party is unable to govern France, the National Front stands ready you know, to assume the mantle of leadership. Uh, we have one 39-year-old between us and Marine Le Pen. Uh, I conclude these remarks with some reflections on the broader intellectual and political context. Looking back, it's hard to avoid the evidence of democratic complacency. Scholars expressed confidence that once countries had reached a certain level of economic development and had made the transition of democracy, there was no turning back. After the epical events of the late 1980s and early 1990s, Francis Fukuyama famously discerned the end of history, that is, the disappearance of serious alternatives to liberal democracy. Systems that combined representative institutions with protections for individual and minority rights, as well as suitably regulated market economies, were thought to be the only game in town. Uh, the economic and governance failures of Russia's new democracy in the 1990s represented the first blow to this optimistic narrative. China's remarkable economic surge suggested that market mechanisms were not necessarily incompatible with authoritarian politics. The erosion of the manufacturing sector throughout much of the West accelerated working class disaffection with existing arrangements. The painfully slow recovery from the financial crisis and ensuing Great Recession created an opening for new political voices, some of them skeptical not just about the policies of the past, but about liberal democratic, liberal democracy itself. When democratization was on the march, the liberal world order was strong and self-confident. The message to countries emerging from economic stagnation and political repression was clear. Join the winners, because we and only we can give you moral and material support as you navigate the, tradition, the difficult transition to open economies and democratic self-government. But as authoritarian governments went on the offensive and democratic self-confidence waned, this message lost much of its credibility. And, if I may say, if the world's most powerful democracy, namely us, continues to challenge transnational institutions, such as 
the EU, the World Trade Organization, and, and until last week, NATO, uh, this trend may very well intensify. In short, the spread of democracy in successive waves after the end of World War II took place under an international canopy of protections and incentives. If liberal democracy is to regain its elan, democratic leaders will have to find new ways of recreating the international environment that allowed self-government to flourish in the post-war era. Thank you very much for your attention.